Hey there, I'm Pastor Christina and welcome to Activate Ministries YouTube channel. If this is your first time here, please, please subscribe to this channel and hit the like button because it really does help push the content out to more eyes. We pray that this message will empower you, ignite you on your walk with the Lord, and unearth the untapped potential that God has placed inside of each and every one of us through the power of His Holy Spirit. And if you haven't heard all that much about Jesus just yet, we pray that this message will do just that. Witness to you the love and power of Jesus. Let's activate. And welcome to those of you that are online, whether you're on YouTube, on our Facebook uh, page, on our website, or Roku, Apple TV. We out, we out here, y'all. We got some, some, some options. So thank you all for tuning in. You're very much a part of what we're doing here. Let us know where you're tuning in from. And if there's anything we can do, feel free to reach out. Uh, prayer at info. I mean, prayer at activate ministries.org. Um, so we can keep you lifted and uh, help you find local community. If, if that's what you need. Um, so amen. 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 So one thing I want to make clear today is God is always speaking. Always speaking. Okay. And just transparent moment. Yesterday was, a, was, a, was an interesting day. And what I've learned is the more I tap into the word of God, the more I pray, the more I spend time in his presence, the louder his voice gets. Okay? So if you're here or if you're online and you don't feel that you're hearing from God and you don't feel that you really know the voice of God, tap into his word more. That's, that's step one. Because it's easy to identify his voice when you're already familiar with it. Amen. And so yesterday, and, and, and what happens with me is he'll, he'll, he'll speak all day long. And depending on my willingness to tap into what he's saying determines how much I'm able to receive. And it might just be a little nudge here. It might just be a little confirmation there or it could be a literal life changing word that he gives me. But the onus is on me to remain tapped in. And one of the one of the times where I'm the most tapped in is when I'm fasting. Because it, when fasting makes you sensitive really to everything. Right. Because because your flesh is yearning for something, um, but you're starving your flesh so that you can receive more spiritually. And so yesterday, uh, as my wife and I, as we as we plan for services, we, we, we fast. And but yesterday was a was a day because our kids are getting to the age now where where is, you know, flag football and there's karate and there's school and there's after school stuff. And it's like, hey, my wife and I can't hang out late on Friday without having to wake up early on Saturday now. I kind of want to take them out of all of this stuff. I can get my wife back on Saturday mornings, huh? But so I'm, I'm getting them ready for, for flag football, and I, and I go downstairs, and I'm making my tea, and I, I'm, I'm filling up my tea. Um, babe, can you grab me that? I'm sorry. I didn't, tell, I didn't plan this. But I'm filling up my tea in, in, this, in this tea bottle here. No, I have no Thank you. Um, and, and as I'm pouring this thing, the sound of the liquid as it fills up continues to, to, to increase in pitch. So it's like, bloop, 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 right? It does that thing. And God is like, hey, the more you fill up on me, the higher I take you. So I, the reason I know that this is God is because this isn't the type of stuff I just sit around and think about, Right? Listening to water bottles being filled. And so we, we, we go to flag football and, you know, my, my son's team, I think they may have won two games this season, may have won two games, but they learn teamwork. They learn sportsmanship. They learn how to shake hands even after you lose. OK, because that, that's important. And I'm looking at him play the game and he's just not enthused. He's, you know, kicking the ball before his team hikes it. Sometimes he takes his own teammates flag. He's not running, even though he's very fast. He's just loafing around the field and his coach is having to move him and put him places. And the first week, it was very frustrating because I'm like, hey, man, we're athletes in my family. Get it. To get it together. Hey, get over here. I'm, I'm, I'm like that sideline coach that's annoying the coach because I'm, I'm making sure my boy is, is, is getting his reps, but he's not he's not doing right. And if I'm honest, he's making me look bad. 
And so yesterday I just had a moment. I just looked back and I'm just like, I don't want him to do this if he's not fulfilled. And then God showed me his heart for his children to be fulfilled. He doesn't want you randomly wandering through life. He wants you in the places and spaces that he's ordained for you to be in and thrive in. And it gives him joy for you to have joy. It gives him pleasure to see you fulfilled. And so if you find yourself in a place lacking fulfillment, Christ is the solution to that. But you have to be the one to acknowledge it and to press in towards it. Amen. The last thing God said to me yesterday, um, my wife asked me the question she asked me every single day. What do you want to eat for dinner? And it's a trick question. Because every time I say what I want to eat, she says, well, I don't want that. And for those desiring marriage, he's going to pair you with someone that never wants to eat what you want to eat. And so I said, okay, I, let, let's do some shrimp. Let's do something that we have in the fridge. She was like, well, I, I kind of really want your lamb chops. And then she started trying to gas me up. You know, I really love your lamb chops. You make really good lamb chops. And she's buttering me up because she's wanting to get what she wants. Women, wives know how to get what they want. Okay? So I submitted. And, and I said, you know what? We're going to go to Costco and get some lamb chops. So we leave the football game. And, and my son is more enthused about Costco than he was about the football game. So he's energetic. He's smiling. He's, you know, his, his mood is up. And so we go and we get the, the, the lamb chops. I come home. I start preparing for service today. And uh, my wife starts to, to, to prep the, the meat and slice the lamb chops. And I go upstairs and, and, and I, I told my wife, I said, it's interesting because I was in Leviticus. I said, it's interesting that I'm reading about the lamb of God. And you desired lamb today. I just left it at that, right? But then God just sometimes won't leave you alone. He, he, he said, hey. Um, you're quick to eat this lamb. This is God talking to me, right? You're quick to eat this lamb, but you would never slaughter it. I'm like, yeah, duh. Yeah, I would never slaughter a lamb. I don't want to be involved. I don't want to see, have anything to do with the process by which this lamb got here in this nice, clean package, right? Nice and fresh, wrapped I don't, have, I don't want to have anything to do with the, 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 the process. I'm not even one of those ones that, that like the farm-to-table stuff. I need some separation between when you killed it and when I ate it. Like, put it in the freezer for a couple weeks, right? You know, put, I don't care. You can put preservatives in that, in that thing. I just don't want to eat it. I, don't want, I want some separation between the, pro, the death process and, and me actually partaking in it. And then he said to me, he said, yeah. A lot of people that's going to hear your message tomorrow, they want my blessing without my blood. I said, all right. And then he took me back to Leviticus. And that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. But I want us to look at Leviticus 1, verse 1 through 9. Because when he said that, I said, yeah, I, I actually went on, online and looked at lamb, and they're very cute animals, right? And then the next picture I saw was a grilled lamb chop. I said, that's the one I like right there. Like, that's cute, but that's delicious, right? And all I want to do is take this lamb from the process that is already packaged, season it, put it on the grill, and then have my wife video me cutting into it for my Instagram foodie followers. She gets annoyed doing that, but I do have food fans out here. Lamb chops are pretty good. So, but he showed me the deeper message behind what we're getting into today. And, and, and today's message is entitled, The Cost of Covenant. The Cost of Covenant. So Le Leviticus 1, verse 1, New Living Translation reads as follows. It says, the Lord called to Moses... From the tabernacle and said to him, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering 
is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so you may be accepted by the Lord. Lay your hand on the animal's head and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. Verse five, then slaughter the young bull in the Lord's presence and Aaron's sons, the priests, will present the animal's blood by splattering it against all sides of the altar that stands at the entrance to the tabernacle. Then skin the animal and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, will build a wood fire on the altar. They will arrange the pieces of the offering, including the head and fat, on the altar, on, on the wood burning on the altar. But the internal organs and the legs must first be washed with water. Then the priest will burn the entire sacrifice on the altar as a burnt offering. It is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. The cost of covenant. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your intentionality in reaching us exactly where we are. So, Lord, I just pray that today you have your way. I pray that your spirit governs this entire experience, Lord God, and that you speak to every heart and mind in a way that will draw them closer to you. And Lord, I thank you that as them drawing, being drawn closer to you, the fruit of their lives will represent that which is connected to you. So I rebuke anything that will try to cause confusion, that will try to block their attention. I, I break every barrier that will prohibit them from, from receiving everything you have from them in this moment. And I ask that you have your way. We consider it done right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, many of us want the blessing without the blood. Now, when we read through Leviticus and we understand how gory sacrifice is, I think it helps give us a different understanding of what it means to be in covenant, what it means to, to, to truly sacrifice, right? It was bloody. You had to put your hand, first off, you had to choose an animal from your own flock without defects. So your best, the best that you have, you have relationship with it. There's, there's equity there, relational equity. And you have to bring this thing and put your hand on it and because of that, your sin is now transferred onto that animal and then slaughter it with your hand on it. So back in the day, in Levitical times, there was no forgiveness. There was no being made clean. There was no being made right with God unless you got your hands dirty. Unless you got blood on you. There was no being made right. There was no atonement for sins. It was bloody, right? And you had to physically participate in the sacrifice. And if you didn't, the consequences were you were cut off from the community, or in some cases, you were even put to death. But there was no being made right from your sin, known or unknown. Even if you weren't aware of the sin you committed, if somebody brought it to your attention, you had to go through this gory, bloody process of sacrifice and atonement, okay? And so I understand why people wouldn't want to do that. Because as much as I love lamb and as much as I love steak, I would never participate in the slaughtering process. And even though we no longer live in, under Le the Levitical law, in order for you to receive everything God has for you, you have to get blood on you. The blood of Jesus. And the way you get the blood of Jesus on you is in covenant. Because his blood is what covers us. His blood is what makes us right with God. His blood is what allows God to look at us and not see all of the stuff that we deserve to go to hell for. Without the blood of Jesus, I'm going to hell. And so are you. I'm not better than me. Without Christ, we're, it's a wrap, Right? And so I want us to really understand the, the, the weight of sacrifice and what it means to us in post-Levitical times, 
post Christ AD so that we can live our lives in a way where we're truly covered. And even though God showed me, even though we're not in Levitical times anymore, there are people that refuse to participate in the sacrifice. Let's take a look also at Hebrews um, 9, verse 13. It reads, under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Think how much the blood of Christ, think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from spiritual, from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Let me read that again. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. Family, if there's a blockage in your worship, there's sinful deeds in your conscience. If there's a blockage in you being able to worship the living God, it's a direct result of sin living in your conscience. Whether, what, whether you, you've, you've done something and you can't get your mind off it or you're planning to do, to do something, our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. So if we just allow ourselves to run on autopilot, we're just sin machines, just thinking about the next thing that we can do to satisfy our own flesh, our own desire, our own lust, our own pride, right? So therefore, we have to surrender to God, accept Jesus Christ so that we can be cleansed. And from that cleansing, we're able to worship and have authentic, engaging experiences with God. You follow? Okay. Now, what's difficult about surrendering to Jesus is just like in the Levitical times, you had to get close to the animal to slaughter it. You had to be in the midst. Like you, you, there was no avoiding the blood, right? With Jesus, it requires intimacy. So truly walking with Jesus is not coming to church on Sunday and then living your regular unchurched life Monday through Saturday. Truly walking with Jesus is an intimate relationship and experience with him. And what happens in relationship with Jesus, the more you focus on him, the more he reveals to you about you. The more he highlights things that need to be surrendered to him. The more he, he, he points out the things that we typically try to brush under the rug because we can't brush these things under the rug and receive and walk in true healing. So relationship with Jesus requires intimacy, and that intimacy brings about everything that needs to be healed, corrected, fixed in us. All right. And just like there are people that want the blessing without the blood, we want the salvation without the sacrifice. We want God to save us from hell, but we don't want to die to ourselves and die to the things that are taking us there. Right? I can't tell you how many times since I've been in ministry that people will call me, people that don't go to church but, but know me from back in the day. I've had people call me from as far back as middle school that, that just keep updated with my wife and I via Facebook. And when they hit rock bottom moments, they call me. So as a minister, for anybody of you desiring ministry as a career, first off, go see a therapist. You'll think something is wrong. You have to be called to do this because it's not, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a life and death thing. And the people that are leading flocks, we're going uh, to be judged more harshly. So I digress, but people call you in their darkest moments when they know you have a relationship with God. And what ends up happening is they want advice for that moment. How can I get out of this situation? 
I am heartbroken. I am, I am distraught. I am lost. How can, like, help pray for me? Pray for me. And the first thing I do before praying is start having a conversation about their relationship with Jesus. Because regardless of how great I pray, if you leave this moment and you don't rededicate your life to Jesus and you don't surrender and you don't enter into a covenant relationship with, with, with God through the blood of Jesus, then you're going to continue to be on this cycle of doing what I want to do, stuff hitting the fan and me coming back for, for, for a savior, getting healed, going back, doing what I want to do, and then coming back for prayer and breakthrough, getting healed, going back, doing what, what I want to do, and then the cycle just continues. But what I found interesting is every time, literally 100% of the time, when someone reaches out and, and needs that level of, they, they need salvation, but they're, ask, they're asking for a solution, a, a solution in the now. They'll nod and agree with what I'm saying about, you know, the word and, and, and how important it is to, to walk with Jesus. But they're really like, hey, just get to the, the good part and how I'm going to be healed from this and what life is going to be like after. And, and how should I pray to get myself through this? Every time, family. We, we pray, give them practical biblical knowledge. And then after that season, gone. Gone. I might get an occasional, hey, appreciate you helping me that one time, but they're back to living life before. They want the Savior, but they don't want the sacrifice. And before we can really experience everything God has for us, we have to be willing to sacrifice everything, family. So the cost of covenant is a word that none of us like to hear but it can be summed up in the s word suffering the cost of a covenant relationship with god is suffering hebrews 10:26 says dear friends if we Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back. Romans 8, 17. Makes it plainly. Romans 8 and 17, it says, and since we are his children, we are also his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his what? Suffering. That's a hard word to hear because nobody says, hey, I'm ready to suffer. You don't go to church and say, hey, can you sign me up for the suffering team? Ain't no suffering ministries out here. It's all about breakthrough and healing and, and, and walking in abundance and all of this. Suffering is the cost of covenant. Now, what, do it mean, what does it mean to suffer with Christ? In order to understand what it means to suffer with Christ, we have to understand how he suffered. One example is found in Luke 22, where it says, he was withdrawn from them, from his disciples, Luke 22, verse 41, about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Some translations say, take this cup of suffering away from me. This is when Jesus knew what his assignment was. He knew he was on the way to the cross to be crucified. But he's in that moment where it's like, God, I don't want to do this. If there's any other way, take this from me. What's up, London? Is that London? How you doing? Back there all quiet. If there's any other way, take this thing from me. And then the very next line, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. 
Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And verse 44 says, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So to suffer with Christ is to be in agony at times. To suffer with Christ is to be in this place of a deep longing for another way. To really want God to deliver you out of this way, even though you know that it's the path. You're like, hey, God, is there another way for me to do this? To suffer with Christ is to do life knowing that he loves you but not understanding why he's chosen this path for you and to do it anyway. When we think of suffering in the church, in most cases, we think about just being broke. We think that suffering, that financial suffering is the worst thing possible and that we, if I just had a million, two, five million dollars, life would be great. We think that, but when you understand what suffering means, money doesn't solve deep agony. It doesn't heal you from pain. It doesn't fix anything. It might help you pacify certain things, but if your heart's not in in the right place, it does more damage. Money, a lot of money does more damage than it does good. Because it just shows you where, where, where your treasure is that your heart will be also. You just buy more things to, to confirm your ratchetry and to keep you in this dark, dark place. But to suffer personal like, and transparency to suffer is for my wife and I to pray for children, be blessed with children, but have to navigate the journey that comes with our oldest son being autistic. To see him needing things, wanting things, not being able to communicate to us what he needs and it, and it causes, and seeing, and seeing the pain and the frustration that causes him and there's nothing I can do to really understand him, that's suffering. For him to be seven years old, right? And, and, and not communicating as effectively as we would like him to for us to hear him just randomly come up and say, Hey mommy, I love you. Right. Hey daddy, I love you. Thank you. Right. We, 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 his facial expressions do it. But a part of us is like, God, why this path? Suffering is to not understand why suffering is to pray for him every day, every night, laying hands on him, saying, God, we're believing you for fluency in language. We're believing you for emotional regulation. We're believing you for no self-harming behavior. We're believing you for healthy relationships around him. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Suffering is to have nevertheless moments where you can pray for whatever it is that you want, you can be really at a place of, of, of pain and confusion and fear. And you can ask for anything. The Lord says, ask for anything in my name and I will do it. Right? And when it's that, that scripture where it says in my name, it means in my authority. So if you ask for anything that Jesus has already authorized, he will do it. But if, he's, if he hasn't authorized that thing to be made so in your life, then he won't. So suffering is to pray with good intention and say, nevertheless, if you have a different way, then we trust it. We trust you. So it's to have nevertheless moments. It's to find yourself in agony, in extreme mental, physical suffering, mental or physical suffering. Like this, this isn't something that, that, you know, you just can, can take a nap and it goes away. No, you find yourself in a moment and, and, and Jesus was sweating to the point where his, his sweat became like drops of blood. 
Some people say he was actually sweating blood. The word says his sweat became like drops of blood. Either way, he was he was going through it. That just shows the level of agony that he was in. And he was God in the flesh. So he knew he was in as close proximity as one could be to God and still went through this. So if he did it for us to suffer with him is for us to do it, too. We can't bail out of the suffering. It's not even possible. You can try to you can try to opt out. I tried it. We have different ways of opting out. We have our vices. We have our unhealthy relationships we tap into. We have our apps that we go to to try to distract us. But walking with God and really being in covenant, the cost of that covenant is suffering. Having those moments of agony, having those nevertheless moments, praying your heart out, but saying, God, if you have a different way, have your way. And lastly, to suffer with Christ means to be crucified with Christ. Galatians 2 and 20 says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My old self has been crucified. That's painful. But pain is also a part of your purpose. (laughs) This ain't a big shouting service. I, I understand. This ain't a big hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus service. But this is the stuff that we need to really internalize and understand. Therefore, when, when life hits you, when, not if, the challenges hit you, I don't care how young or how old you are, life is going to happen. When this happens, you're not caught off guard. You're not frantic. You're not out of your mind. You're, you're, it's confirming what God has already told you. And so what we want to do is know how we should navigate these things when they come up because the enemy is going to give you an alternative. The enemy is going to resurface that person that you had the one night stand with 27 times. The enemy is going to resurface the connect that has the best weed in the city. The enemy is going to resurface the things that will keep you distracted from God, that will keep you out of close proximity of Jesus And have you just medicate, numb, and just brush everything else under the rug? So we need to know how to deal with life for real. And I don't know about you, but the the Bible is my single source of truth when it comes to navigating life. So I have been crucified. My old self has been crucified with Christ. Understand that that's going to hurt. My old self was promiscuous. My old self never wanted to be married. My old self was going to be in these streets until I was mid 50s, 60s, right? My old self bought into the thing that, hey, men age like wine. So I'm just going to get better and I'm, the younger girls are going to be attracted still. I'm out here. That's, that's, that's what my mindset was. And then what happens? He allows me to find myself in the lowest place I've ever been in life. I am in agony. Some of you know the story. Quick summary. Living like a maniac, crashed my car into a building, drinking and driving, went to jail. So I'm in jail. And I'm like, God, and I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of out of my mind. But because I was raised in church, thank God for my parents. Because I had a church foundation, because I had a knowledge of who Jesus was, I knew who to go to in my lowest moment. So even though I blew a point two zero three, which is three times the legal limit, even though I'm sitting in jail, not knowing how I'm going to get out, I'm like, God, all right, something, something 
we got to figure this out. And after he met me in that moment, I dedicated my life to, to, to Jesus then, then, hung over in a jail cell. First thing that happened when I got home, my roommate said, oh, man, all you need is another beer. The devil is fast. He wants to offer me an alternative as soon as I've made the decision that I'm not drinking anything. And God revealed to me that it wasn't even a drinking problem that I had. He said, my problem was promiscuity. I just used drinking as a way to numb myself to his voice. So then this promiscuous man now is saying, I'm not going to live that way anymore. Painful. Can I be honest? Can I be real with y'all? Painful. I had developed a habit and an appetite of going out every night that I could during the week and right now I am dedicating my life to Christ and committing myself to, to a new way of living. And now when the text messages come through, I can't respond. And they're coming through more frequently, my man. It was like, where were you last week before I made this decision? But all of a sudden, it picked up. And I wasn't just getting text messages. I'm getting pictures. I'm getting videos. I'm getting all of this stuff. And I'm being tempted in ways I've never been tempted before. But then God highlighted to me, like, that's how you know you're on the right path. When you make a decision to follow God, the enemy is going to turn it up on you. Because he's not, you, you might not have been tested previously. But that might be because you weren't really in covenant relationship with God for real. When the enemy knows that you're serious about your walk with God, he turns it up because he knows what a threat you are to his kingdom. So dying to self, having to go in, in public settings sober. What's that about? I've never done that before. I would drink something every single day. It, it was just my norm. So dying to that. Dying to people pleasing, dying to being the guy that has all the connects and going out to all the parties in the bars, knowing all the bartenders, drinking for free, dying to all of that. I don't like paying for stuff. I had free bartenders. I had to die to that. But as I died to that, God started to highlight things. He started to birth things in me that caused me to be attracted to the things he had for me. Whereas had I been numbing myself, had I met Christina in 2012, it, we would not be here. But having been crucified with Christ brings clarity. It allows you to see the things God has for you for what they are. Right? And even though it's a painful process, we know what happened after the crucifixion. Yes, Jesus was hung on a cross. Yes, it was bloody and brutal. Yes, he was slapped, nailed to the cross, stabbed in his, in, his, in his side, whipped, mocked. But we know on the third day, he rose. Above all of that, above all of our sin, above everything that keeps us bound. And he became that sacrificial lamb. So just like in Levitical times, how they put all of their hands on the animal and God recognized that animal that animal's death atoning for their sins, Jesus died, and everything that is in us that causes us to miss the mark, God looks at Jesus having already paid the price for it. So I thank God that I don't live back in Levitical times because every time we did something wrong, we would have to go and kill something. I would be bloody every day because I do stuff every day. But because of the blood of Jesus, it's already paid for. So we can walk in freedom and live in freedom and not live in fear of what's to come because of our missing the mark, because Jesus already took that. So as we crucify ourselves with Christ, we already position ourselves to be uplifted with him. Whew. OK, I got bad news. I got good news. Which I want first. Okay, bad news. Bad news is found in Hebrews 10, verse 26. It says, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, 
There is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. In Levitical times, it was the animal, the bull, the goats, the, the, the herd, whatever, right? But then God came and made a new covenant. And covenant just means binding agreement, typically initiated by God. So we're in a binding agreement that Jesus died. And if we surrender and receive him as Lord and Savior, we will be saved, period. If you hear that truth, and then according to the, listen, this ain't me talking. This is the writer of Hebrews. If you hear that and you deliberately continue sinning after you've received the knowledge, there's no longer any sacrifice that'll cover you. There is only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume his enemies. If you're not under the blood of Jesus, you are an enemy of God. That's tough, ain't it? Not the loving God. God wouldn't do that. That's what his word says. I'm just here to tell you what the word says. I'm not here to tell you what you want to hear all the time. There are people that tell you what you want to hear and it causes you to justify your actions even when you know they don't align with the word of God. But if you understand that Jesus died for every mistake you make and you then leave and continue to have recreational sin activity, right? Sin with benefits. Come on now. There's no saving you. So there's a sense of urgency for people to walk in covenant with God. We are in the last days. Life is a vapor. I'm 41, fam. Where'd that happen? I was just 21. Now my knees ache for no reason. Elbow hurts now. Life is fast. It's a vapor. So there's a sense of urgency. If you had made up in your mind previous to coming here that you were just checking a box, previous to tuning in, that you were just going to check a box and hear a sermon. Now you've heard the truth. If you do life did after understanding the truth, there's no other covering out there. I don't care what you see on Instagram. I don't care how many crystals you got in your house or how much sage you burn. I don't care how many mediums you consult. The Bible refers to... to, to that as spiritual prostitution is opening up your soul to all types of stuff. You're just out here, right? Spiritual prostitution. There is one way. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. No one gets to the Father except me, says Jesus. And to go through Jesus, you have to go through covenant. And to go through covenant, you have to go through suffering. Now, here's the good news, because I was called to preach the good news. First Peter 5 and 10, it says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you have suffered a little while, say a little while. After you have suffered a little while. He will restore, support, strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. He will restore, support, and strengthen you, and he will place you on a firm foundation. Listen, I used to think that the promise was heaven. But when you read this, you understand that all of these promises are for this life. Because the Bible tells me in heaven, there is no suffering. So there's no need for me to be strengthened. The Bible says that there in, in heaven, it's all peace. It's your place of rest. So I'm not going to need to strive to do anything. So if God is going to first restore, support, and strengthen me, and place me on a firm foundation, that means that my life in this realm is going to be restored. 
that I'm going to find myself supported here. Now that I'm going to find myself strengthened for the things that God is going to allow me to navigate through and he's going to place me on a firm foundation, no more rocky ground. No more instability, no more not knowing what's coming next, no more living in the dark and living in ambiguity, clarity, vision, strategy, direction, blessing, provision, everything that God has for you is going to come as a result of your covenant relationship with him. Hallelujah. Please, family. Understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. And while we are called to suffer, we're also called to share in his glory. His eternal glory. Eternity starts at your yes. It doesn't start at your death. It doesn't start when you transition to be with the Lord. Eternity has no beginning and no end. Therefore, when you accept and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and you enter into a covenant binding agreement with him, your eternal life starts at that moment. And it just continues when Jesus returns. I don't know about you, but I want to share in that glory now. As much as I'm able to share in that glory now, I want it. I want it. I need it. My life depends on it. Hey, thanks again for watching this video. Whoa, what a message, right? If this message impacted your life, please share it in the comments below because I guarantee you, your testimony will help inspire someone else on their journey with the Lord Jesus. To find out more about this ministry and how you can partner with us, visit our website at activateministries.org. Let's activate.